So I was out uh, walking one day and I came across a very distraught man on a bridge who was ready to throw himself off the bridge. And I came up to him and I said, no, don't do it. There's so much to live for. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. And I said, me too. Are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, I'm a Christian. And I said, me too. Uh, Catholic or Protestant? And he said, Protestant. And I said, me too. What kind? And he said, Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? And he said, Northern Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? And he said, Northern Conservative Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern Conser Conservative Baptist uh, New England region? And he said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? And he said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879. And I said, die heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> That joke was uh, named on an, in an online poll a few years ago, the funniest religious joke. And the fact that it was named the funniest joke, I think, about religion tells you something about the way people think about religion. I'm not sure exactly why um, some of the church has been so resistant to the idea of taking the ecological crisis seriously. Um, I think um, the polarization of right and left has just um, uh, made it difficult because um, a free market on the one hand, free market on the right uh, is opposed to kind of state tyranny and communism on the left and any attempts to kind of rein in the free market smacks of um, things of the left that carry with them all kinds of other uh, baggage. Um, I suppose that's my best uh, guess at why it's been so difficult. Um, another response to that might be it's been difficult because um, there are people's oxes are being gored, you know, there are certain economic interests uh, that don't want to address uh, issues like climate change. Um, but I think, it's, I think there are more and more Christians that are coming around to seeing the importance of this issue. And I think one of the things that Pope Francis does especially well is show the, um, not just the ethical but the theological stakes uh, in this, that there's a whole theology of uh, domination of the earth that runs counter to the theology of the cross and runs counter to the idea of humility that um, that Christ calls us to. Um, there's a, uh, a whole anthropology that goes along with this crisis, a kind of anthropology of looking down upon the earth from a, a height and uh, and having no having no fetters. Uh, this kind of ideal of uh, unfettered freedom that we consider to be an ideal, um, but which is a very dangerous ideal. And I think he's done a, a great job uh, in Laudato Si of talking about um, the importance of uh, being a part of creation and not striding above it. Um, and uh, there's a, a whole anthropology. I mean, it's right there in Genesis 3, right? Eat of this and you will be like gods. And that, I think, gets, um, gets right at the heart of the ecological crisis. That's a really interesting question. I am working, supposedly, on a book on idolatry. And idolatry is a really moving target because I think there is a sense in which the great generation uh, the greatest generation and so on had a very strong uh, allegiance to the nation state and the flag that current generations, upcoming generations don't have. 
and um, and I think that's a really important insight, and I think that's true. I think that's right. And so, um, if you're going to talk about idolatry, you need to talk uh, in different terms. There's a, a more subtle kind of idolatry, it seems to me, not of attachment but detachment. It's the kind of idolatry that comes with a consumer uh, market, a consumer uh, society. Pope Francis uses the term idolatry all the time when he talks about the economy. Um, but it's not an idolatry of attachment to things, it's sort of an idolatry of detachment to things in some ways. You know, um, what's really important is the, um, is the effect on the self. You know, Jean-Luc Marion talks about idolatry as if it would be an actual um, achievement, a kind of positive achievement in, in this world in which we kind of just, just flit from one thing to another. And so that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to wrestle with exactly. Um, and I'm not exactly sure uh, where that's going, but I think there is a, a sense in which, um, I mean, you, one of the, when I do presentations on this, I'll show uh, slides of shoe commercials over the course of the 20th century. And in 1920, you've got a picture of a shoe and some tightly worded text explaining the virtues of the shoe. And in mid-century, you've got a picture of a shoe and a woman groveling at a man's feet saying, keep, keep her in her place or something. So you've got this association of an article with sex and power and so on. And then the third slide is uh, a, a Nike commercial that just has a swoosh and it says, write, write the future. And it doesn't even show or mention shoes at all. And it seems to me there's a kind of movement there of kind of taking leave from the actual object itself and and working it into this kind of mythology of the self and uh, and and that is really interesting to me so there's a certain there's a certain sense in which idolatry is always about the self it's a mirror to the self and um, and that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to explore um, but stay tuned I'm not exactly sure yeah. where I'm going with that um, I think the nation state and the market have become fused in such a way that, um, that it's hard to kind of pry them apart, um, which is one of the things that I think is uh, paradoxical about um, or, or deceptive about our political discourse is we tend to think that we have one party of the state, the Democrats, and one party of the market, the Republicans. Uh, but in fact, the state and corporation have fused to such an extent that we really don't have two parties anymore. You know, the parties are distinguished on the basis of a few hot button sexual issues, but the real, uh, the real issues, um, there's not much difference. I don't know if I sit down and think I've got to incorporate some humor into this essay, um, but I used to be funny and I think a lot of that just sort of flows uh, naturally. Now I'm a boring old man, but, um, but I think a lot of that comes naturally. And I do think there's a certain sense in which, um, you know, if you're a Christian, then history is a comedy. Uh, in the sense of uh, there's a, uh, a comic resolution, meaning that there's uh, going to be a happy ending, that history is ultimately not a tragedy, right? Um, that salvation is is what um, what what the final the the final word has, is salvation, and um, and there's a sense in which, although that's a different sense of the word comedy, um, I think it's related. You know, you can have a certain sort of sense of humor about these things if you think that um, it's not always so serious because God's going to sort things out um, ultimately, you know. Um, I also think that, I mean, there's just, uh, there's a, a certain earnestness about like a Richard Dawkins, for example, and the attempt to reduce everything to a certain kind of rational order. And I just think if you spend enough time on planet Earth looking around, um, you just realize how absurd life is and how absurd people are. And it then becomes easier to accept things like, you know, the virgin birth and transubstantiation because um, uh, we have a very funny God, I think.
Yeah, I think it's been wonderful. You know, um, there's a real sense uh, of humility about him. Um, and so the church doesn't just scold the world, but the church invites the world to partake in something richer and more beautiful. You, you uh, attract by showing that the, the life we have of the gospel is true and good and beautiful. Um, he has, you know, I, I oftentimes think of it in terms of this division among Catholics between uh, clarity and charity. There is a, a certain kind of uh, bishop and culture warrior, I think, that um, thinks that the church's main task in an era of confusion and uh, relativity or relativism is to be clear uh, and to explain the church's doctrines clearly and to make sure that the lines dr are drawn clearly. But instead of clarity, I think Pope Francis uh, is interested in charity first, that people won't listen to you until you uh, warm their hearts first, until there's a, a kind of engagement with the person, uh, and then you can begin to talk about uh, doctrinal matters, which aren't unimportant, but again, are oftentimes given more uh, importance than, and, and centrality than they, than they merit. Yeah, I think he's a kind of recognizable type of figure uh, among church people in, in Chile uh, and other places in Latin America from a certain era. Um, you know, the priests who very intentionally kind of went out into the, the poor and forgotten areas of society and, um, and live with the people and try to share as much of their life as possible. And he's kind of rehabilitated, you know, that's something that's associated with uh, liberation theology, and he's certainly kind of rehabilitated the whole notion of liberation theology. You know, the, his, uh, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, has written, co-written a book with Gustavo Gutierrez, which is something that never would have happened uh, uh, until uh, until his papacy. Um, but I think he's um, uh, he represents a kind of broader swath of the church in Latin America that uh, intentionally kind of goes out of the pleasant and uh, well-appointed quarters of the hierarchy and the clergy and uh, tries to share a little bit of the, the life of the, of the poor. Yeah, I guess that's an easy one for me, Stanley Harawas. Um, I met him as an undergraduate at Notre Dame, and um, he just kind of rocked my, rocked my world. I think the question that he was asking uh, underneath all the other questions was uh, what difference does it make to be a Christian and uh, you know why bother really um, and that struck me at the right time and I think set me off on a different uh, course certainly on a on a different career course I think I was planning on being a lawyer I started out as a chemical engineer and then switched to theology and thought I'd go to law school but Stanley kind of uh, convinced me otherwise on that um, but his style of doing theology as well, of doing not boring theology, I think was something that really uh, appealed to me. Uh, so um, yeah, Stanley was a, was a huge influence. Mm -hmm.